So I'll try to give you the big picture. The first picture we showed you is the, uh, the process, all right? The flow chart, where it all starts. It starts from the top, and that's our hermeneutics. Our recipe must be right. If we have problem with our recipe, then everything else goes wrong, all right? And so the recipe must be right, and then tomorrow we look into exegesis. How do we apply these 10 principles into an actual passage uh, tomorrow, all right? But uh, this afternoon, we just started on uh, hermeneutics, the Bible as a human book, all right? The first six in the 10 uh, principles for interpretation, those six can be applied in reading the newspaper, in reading magazines, not just the Bible. Any human document, you need all six, all right? The first six. So those are the six, grammatically, historically, culturally, contextually, literarily, and then understanding it logically. Now, we gave you a picture, the process we're in, uh, the processes we're in, God brings us His Word from God to the mind of man that, called, that is called Revelation. So that's the process of Revelation. Now, friends, we believe the Bible is already complete. The book of Revelation, that's why it says there, you're no longer to add anything to this. This is the close the closure of the uh, God's revelation, uh, the written revelation of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't speak to us anymore. All right? Now, obviously, God can speak to us in different ways today. But God will never tell you something that will contradict what He already revealed in the Bible. If it's the same source, the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Bible, will not tell you to do something that will contradict what he already revealed in his word. And so that would be the guide. We can listen to his voice, but we need to verify it with the word of God. Is this consistent with, with, with what he already revealed? All right, so that's the, uh, that's the balance that we have there. Now, from the mind of man, God said, write it down. You know, the uh, process of inspiration. And again, we have our key verse there, looking at the word scripture and looking at the word inspiration. And so we have those uh, verses. And then finally, from the written word to the heart of the reader. And that's the process of illumination. The process of illumination. And this third process, wherein we benefit from what God has already revealed, is very important, without which nobody will be blessed every Sunday morning after the service. So it's not how good the pastor or the preacher is on Sunday morning. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of times people complain, oh, the pastor is not so anointed. The pastor is not a good preacher. But you know what, friends? It, it works both ways. You need to have an anointed preacher, but you also need to have an anointed listener. Because if the listeners are not anointed, they're not illumined. I mean, the Word of God will not make an impact in your life. In some churches today, I believe you don't need to change the pastor. You need to change the members. <laughs> yeah. You know, they keep complaining. The pastor is not gifted. The pastor is not anointed. But you know what? A lot of times the problem is there at the pulpit, at the uh, pews, no? so pews, not at the pulpit. Okay, so two verses here. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you and told the truth. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He is our teacher. And then 2 Timothy 2, 7, reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And so that, you know, taking the time to really reflect on the Word of God. And sometimes, you know, we have issues with pastors. They don't have time to really study God's Word and they're going to preach on Sunday morning. And, you know, Sunday afternoon, on Saturday evening, they're going to uh, do a little study. And then they, they just say, as the Spirit leads tomorrow. <laughs> you know, again, we have no problem with as the Spirit leads. But I can assure you, friends, if you start Monday night, the Spirit is already leading you on Monday night. You don't have to wait for Saturday evening. We need to take time to reflect on what He is saying. And then the Lord will give us insight into all this. So... What we have here, if we consider a ground level, at ground level, we have the first six uh, rules. The Bible is a human book. And we already know the first six. Come on, without your notes, tell me what the first six rules are. Understand it? Grammatically, 
historically, culturally, contextually, literarily, and logically. That's right. So we have that covered already, grammatically, historically, culturally, contextually, uh, literarily, and logically. Okay? And then, the ones that are below the ground, okay, these are our personal convictions about the Bible. This is why we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The last four, this is conviction, below the ground. You don't see this, but this is what makes us believe the Bible indeed is the Word of God. Oops, my feedback just portion of And so here, rule number seven, write down the word inerrant. The Bible being a divine book is inerrant. Inerrant means? All right. And so without error, and inerrancy is consistent with God's character. Let's read this portion. It is consistent with God's character. Ready? Read. If Scripture is God's inspired word and God speaks only truth, then Scripture is completely true. All right? So, what, why we believe the Bible is inerrant is rooted in our belief that God Himself is inerrant. And so, God inspired His word and therefore the Scripture is completely true. It's also consistent with the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we see here full inerrancy in terms of the character of Christ. So here we have God. We have a human parent and the Holy Spirit to produce the living word. And the living word is without sin. And then in terms of the Bible, you have God and the human authors with the Holy Spirit. You produce the written word and the written word is without error. And so that's the, uh, that's the comparison between the living word and the written word. And so the living word... It's the truth embodied in the incarnate word, and then the written word is truth expressed in the inspired word. Again, you won't have so much time to write that, but you have the DVD. All right, praise God. Okay. And then, number eight, the Bible being a divine book is authoritative. All right, it is authoritative. And this is where, uh, even among Christians, it may be different. Our number one source of authority is the Bible. The pastor is not the authority in the church. The Bible is. We pastors, we preachers, we can commit mistakes. We submit to the authority of the Word of God. And so, uh, there's no such thing as an uh, impalliable uh, pastor. And uh, again, this is where we differ. Uh, in terms of authority, in the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the number one authority is the Pope, all right? And so whatever the Pope says, that becomes dogma, especially if it's, uh, you know what they call the uh, ex cathedra. Ex means out of, cathedra means chair. And so when the Pope is seated on the chair of St. Peter and makes a pronouncement, in the late 1950s, he said, uh, the Virgin Mary ascended to heaven, bodily ascension of the Virgin Mary. Even though you don't find that in the Bible, that becomes dogma, that becomes truth, that the Virgin Mary did not die at all because she's free from original sin. Her body cannot rot, and so she just went straight to heaven. Now, friends, we don't, we don't believe that. That's not found in the Bible. But the number one authority is the Pope. The second authority is tradition. You know, something that has been passed on through tradition it becomes authority, even if it's not found in the Bible, even if it's against the Bible. Like, you know, they wear this, uh, ano yung tawag doon? Scapular. You know the scapular? Right now, we have the plastic scapular, but the cloth scapular, it has a plastic cover, but it's written there, if you die wearing this, you'll go straight to heaven. Okay, that's what's written there. That's why you don't remove the scapular, because, you know, if you die swimming and you remove it, then you'll go to heaven to purgatory, you know. So you better wear it so that if you die, you go straight to heaven. Again, friends, uh, we don't believe this can be warranted in the Bible. And so, but then tradition is a source of authority. And then number three is the Bible. So you have the Pope, the tradition, and then the Bible. So we evangelicals, Bible-believing Christians, we are a distinct minority. We believe the number one source of authority is the Bible. The 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 head of the denomination is not the source of authority. The pastor is not the source of authority. The Bible is the source of authority. So that's uh, number eight. That's our conviction about the Bible. And then number nine, rule number nine, 
The Bible being a divine book has unity. The Bible being a divine book has unity. And uh, the unity of the Bible is one of the amazing evidences that the Bible indeed is the Word of God. Consider the following. Number one, the long period of time in writing the Bible. You know, the Bible is the only sacred book in all religions of the world where you have something written in 1500 years, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's a gap of about 400 years. And so this, this is the only sacred writing written in 1500, 1600 years, uh, according to some estimate. Uh, the writings of Buddha, of course, they were written while he was still alive, and then some of his disciples added some more, but during the lifetime of Buddha. And uh, again, the other scriptures just within the lifetime of their teacher. Not only the long period of time, but the different geographical places where it was written. The Bible is the only sacred book written in three continents. Some portions were written in Africa, other portions written in Asia, and then other portions written in Europe. The Bible is the only sacred book written in three continents. Of course, the Quran was written just there in uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, the Buddhist writings, the Hindu writings right there in India. But the Bible in three different continents. And then number four, the different writers and different occupations. About 40 different writers living in different places. You know, they, do, they, do, they don't really know each other. And then they have different occupations. They are not all, all uh, religious people. And we have farmers, we have kings, we have fishermen, and uh, different trades, 40 and 19 different occupations. And then the different styles and forms of writing, about 15 different literary genre. Of course, there's more, but the one you have there in your workbook, we have listed there 15 different literary genre. And then, of course, three different languages. Most of the Old Testament written in uh, Hebrew, some portions, just five portions written in Aramaic, and then, of course, the New Testament written in Greek. Because the Bible has unity, therefore, number one, it will not contradict itself. It will not contradict itself. Now, I know that there are some things, sometimes we, if we read them, you know there seems to be contradiction here. Uh, we will learn this in the second, uh, second portion of this uh, in a little while, but... Let me just point out here that a lot of the seeming contradictions is actually because of the lack of information regarding that particular uh, passage or story. For example, one glaring, one glaring contradiction we find here in Matthew, it says here, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, it says that two blind men were sitting by the roadside. So here, according to Matthew, Jesus Christ was leaving Jericho and then two blind men. But then according to the version of Dr. Luke, he said, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man, not two, but just a blind man, was sitting by the roads. Now that's a glaring uh, contradiction there. Because if Jesus Christ is leaving Jericho, and then Luke says he's approaching Jericho, how do you reconcile that? Because if he's, if he's leaving, he cannot be approaching at the same time. I mean, how do you, how do you leave and approach at the same time? So he has to walk back ways and then, you know, to, in order to, I don't know. But uh, that seems to be a glaring contradiction. But you know what? As archaeologists kept on digging, they found out that when Jericho was condemned, God said, you are not to rebuild that city anymore, but they actually rebuilt a city, Jericho, in another place, another location in the time of Jesus. And so, depending on your, on your reference point, you could be leaving or approaching is it the old Jericho or is it the new Jericho that you're referring to? So that can be consistent if uh, that archaeological finding is correct, you know, that there's this new Jericho in terms of location. But then for the two blind men and then one blind man, you know, that's not really a contradiction. I mean, Matthew was concerned with the two blind men, but Luke was only, was only concerned about the one blind man. So that's no, no contradiction there. So again, a lot of this seeming contradiction, we just need to research more. We need to find out what's really, uh, what, what was happening during that time, and especially some of these uh, physical details no, in these uh, stories. Okay, that, that's the blind man. And then, because the Bible contains unity, its obscure and secondary passages are to be interpreted in light of clear and primary passages. You know, I always, I always say this in my seminars, you do not 
make a doctrine out of one verse. You do not make a doctrine out of one verse. A doctrine is always a summation of the teaching from the Old to the New Testament. It's a summation, it's a summary of all the teaching. All right? And so, uh, there are some obscure passages, and so that means we focus on the primary passages whenever, especially in coming up with a doctrine. And then, the Bible often interprets itself, and so you can read one passage, and then it's clarified in another passage. Uh, this is, again, the last one here. This is what you call the progressive revelation. Progressive revelation. Progressive revelation simply means that God did not reveal himself at one point, 100 percent at that one one time, but progressively revealed himself until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the full revelation of God. Everything else is a shadow of the substance. The substance is in Christ. So that's the progressive revelation. And that's why there are things in the Old Testament that are no longer uh, functioning in the New Testament because Christ is already there. That's the full revelation. We don't sacrifice lambs anymore because the Lamb of God is here once and for all sacrificed for us. So that's their, our idea of progressive revelation. Therefore, number 10, the Bible being a divine book has mystery. The Bible being a divine book has mystery. And so here you'll find the mystery in terms of uh, prophecy. There's mystery in terms of miracles. And there's mystery in terms of doctrine. Again, it's very clear that man with his finite mind cannot contain the infinite mind of God. And that's why there are certain things that seem to be illogical. They're not against human logic. They're beyond human logic. So friends, I'm not bothered so much by things that I don't understand in the Bible. I really do not know what argument Satan used to convince one-third of the angelic host to rebel against God? You know, I've been thinking about that. Ano kaya yung ginamit na argument ni Satan, ano? I mean, can you imagine? You're there in the very presence of God, and then he outwitted one-third of the angelic host, make them rebel against God. Ang galing! Super galing ng argumento niya. Ano kaya yun? Yun ang iniisip ko. Friends, I'm not bothered by things that I don't understand. What I'm bothered with are the things that I understand and cannot obey. The Bible says, love your wife the same way Christ loved the church and sacrifice himself for the church. It's clear. We are to love our wives in a sacrificial way. Now, that bothers me. <laughs> because, you know, our problem with selfishness and everything else and, uh, you know, that's, that's what bothers me. Not so much what I do not understand, but the things that I understand and I'm not able to obey fully. All right. So, the Bible has mystery. So, we have four now. We add to the six. The Bible is a divine book. Number one, it is inerrant. It is authoritative. It has unity. And it has mystery. And this is below the ground. This is just our personal conviction about the Bible. So let them, let's put them all together now. The recipe, there are five items. Number one, understand God's Word grammatically. Number two, understand God's Word historically. Number three, understand God's Word culturally. Number four, understand God's Word contextually. Number five, understand God's Word literarily. Number six, understand God's Word logically. Now, that's the Bible as a human book. Now, not all six may be required in studying a passage. You know, some passages, you won't have to understand the cultural background. You know, it's clear what the verse is saying with no cultural background. But at least you have all six to consider when you're studying a uh, particular passage. But then the last four, the Bible not only is a human book, but the Bible as a divine book. And so number seven, we need to uh, understand that God's Word is inerrant. Number eight, we need to understand that God's Word is authoritative. Number nine, understand that God's Word has unity. And then number ten, understand that God's Word has mystery. All right. So that actually completes our study on hermeneutics.